Already. Now let's continue. Making sense uh, of this equation. <coughs> From these basic relationships, I said that I am going to ignore for the moment depreciation and the x variable. And I'm going to convert this into this form. n is equal to s over v. This is the condition for steady state. That's how we came to this final relationship. From an illustration using a Cope and Douglas type of a production function, we have added a definition. Then we try to make under, we try to understand that definition. We add a new assumption, added new variables, and we reached to a point after eliminating the excess baggage from our uh, modeling system, we said that under long-run equilibrium, the population growth rate must be equal to saving rate divided by the capital output ratio. This is the condition for long-run equilibrium. And since this is something big, I'm going to give fancier names for it. On this side, population growth rate, exogenous. Okay, I'm not contesting that. But it will be referred to as the natural rate of growth. It's natural, it happens. Even though everything else is constant, uh, the economy will grow on its natural causes by the rate of population. Simple as it is. The right hand side, both of them, is known as the warranted or required. Warranted or required rate of growth. It is warranted because it has to satisfy in aggregate for long run equilibrium. You cannot do much with the natural rate. It is the uh, economies, households, a agents, tastes and preferences, historical conditions, uh, uh, it has to be uh, adapted to. What will adapt? The warranted rate of growth. This condition was worked by Daniel Harrod and D.U.C. Domar back in 1941 to 1943. That is called the precondition for equilibrium growth. It is known as the Harrod Domar condition. Harrod and Domar condition for growth. Historically, their argument was that uh, if you look at these uh, parameters, n is exogenously given from the people's side. S is <coughs> here it is. S is the investment share of output. It's another behavioral relationship. After all, Chinese save and invest a lot. Americans and Turks save and invest less. It is a given factor. V is capital output ratio. What's the amount of machine time you have worked to produce corn? 
<coughs> and it's a technological parameter. Your friends at the uh, engineering faculty uh, will have better ideas than we do. So what I'm trying to say is that it will be a one out of a zillionth possibility that miraculously these three variables from gathered from here and there will be in equilibrium as n is equal to s over v. If it happens, it will be a miracle. And if it happens out of miraculously, but then a shock happens, a group of Syrians come for a couple of years, and we are thrown out of equilibrium, even if we were miraculously there, there is not, nothing to guarantee that we'll stay there over time. This is a razor's edge model. Even if it's an equilibrium, it is not a stable equilibrium, according to Harad and Domar. Why? Because there is no mechanism to compensate for the loss of equilibrium in case it happens. So the Harad and Domar's perception of equilibrium back in 1940s was that this is a razor's edge phenomenon. One, it will be a miracle if it ever exists. Two, even if it exists miraculously, any single shock that perturbs it has nothing in among these variables, as I have worked until now, to bring the system back into the equilibrium again. This is a very pessimistic way of looking at things. But if you consider the days that Harad and Dewey Domar were working, again, independently, and uh, then uh, they come up with these ideas. And then uh, the guys met uh, uh, at a public bar in uh, Paris, drinking wine, and say that I found this. Anyway, just uh, uh, of course, it didn't happen this way. But uh, the idea was out there independently. Again, out of respect, we say it's a Harald Domar condition. The days are the darkest days of the human history, the war that is preceding the Great Depression, 1930s. And uh, they are uh, simply carrying over the Keynesian ideas that a market system cannot bring equilibrium on its own. You have to have the uh, fine tuning of effective demand through government taxation or government expenditures. One unit of lira is multiplied by the Keynesian multiplier. Uh, if the unemployment ga gap is 100, if the multiplier is 5, then you have to uh, spend 20 units, ha ha ha, 30 points of your time. Uh, exam question. That, uh, that was the vision of the, the state of affairs of uh, economics back then. They are simply taking over this pessimistic Keynesian observation to the long run. So even if there is equilibrium, it is not stable. Then based on this, mainly two explanations emerged. One is the neoclassical explanation. And this is V. That is, V will adjust. That is, capital output ratio will be flexible subject to market signals. The economy on its own will bring equilibrium relationship over the long run through changes in V. V is capital output ratio. And this is introduced by Solow, 1956, the theory of growth. It is one of the top 10 
mostly cited uh, publications, papers in our profession. <clears throat> and this is the model that you are familiar with. There is a critical capital labor ratio. Uh, there is a transitional growth. You reach the city state. You have done a, a Excel tables, uh, worked with data on this. And now we are going to, I'm uh, trying to tell you its origins. So, Solov said, no, the world is not as pessimistic as it is. Steady state is stable, but you have to assume a harmonious production function and investment saving relationship. This can be relaxed, but uh, uh, for the time being, uh, it's one of our uh, toolbox. And if you leave the economy on its own, without any government interference or any, uh, uh, anything else, the economy will bring equilibrium to itself through its endogenous market behavior, a stable, long-run relationship. And we are going to uh, start studying it uh, starting Wednesday, both empirically first and then uh, theoretically. Then in 1961 and beyond, Nicholas Caldor, Passinetti, Greg Nani, Schraffa, uh, a couple of, John Robinson, a couple of characters stationed in the UK Cambridge, University of Cambridge uh, in UK, uh, United Kingdom, in British Cambridge, had argued that even though V may be assumed constant, uh, it may be parameter, uh, it may just behave as it is, saving rate, the average saving rate will adjust. And this is called the Neo-Ricardian or Neo-Keynesian school, one of the three schools of thought that I had mentioned. Saving rate will adjust. How? Through changes in functional distribution of income. Functional distribution of income, that is capital, profit, land, rent, and interest. This will change endogenously in the system, and this will satisfy the Harad Domar's long run equilibrium condition. What happens to V is not that important. What happens to N is not important. According to the Cambridge School, the University of Cambridge of UK, <coughs> they have come up with a a world vision where the average saving rate, S, will adjust. So two possibilities, S or V. And as I said, there are hybrid models up to an extent, S to some extent, V, uh, to some extent even N. The the, our profession is full of rich explanations. But this is the main division of contest. <coughs> And as I said, we are going to start with Solov towards the, the last 20 minutes of our Wednesday's lecture. Any questions? Any comments? Buyurun. What was the school of thought of Robertson? Neoclassicals. Neoclassicals, yeah. Harald and, and Domar is mostly uh, empirist. Uh, they are simply making empirical observations over the Second War years, coming from a very dark, gloomy, pessimistic environment, Great Depression, the, the rise of the Nazis, the, uh, the Second War. Uh, their idea is that market system cannot do this. And now, uh, starting from their point of view, we are saying that Solov in 1956 gives a neoclassical answer to this, theoretically. And uh, this is somewhat happening 1961 and beyond, and culminating in, mostly in 1968 uh, uh, in a congress in Rome. Uh, this is the history behind this. But now, Let's come back uh, to our uh, 
story. Per capita income differences. What is per capita income? Y over L, right? This is <coughs> this is the per what this is the difference that we are interested in. Output or GDP per person. This is what we are interested in. Now uh, you must be saying at this moment, Hojan Nihayet, yani this is all. We, want, we are after explaining this phenomenon, this animal, y over l, algebraically. Uh, we have spent almost more than an hour in uh, definitions, uh, algebra, uh, stories of dead economists. Uh, uh, why do we need this? I hope you are going to appreciate it uh, when we solve this. Well, why are, what is uh, y over l? According to our uh, production function, that is k to the power alpha, a to the power 1 minus alpha. And since I moved l over here, l to the power minus alpha. So if we are using this neoclassical production function, and if I am trying to explain per capita income differences, well, this is what it is. And all these Ks and Ls are subject to all of these stories. <clears throat> I know you hate me. But uh, in order to carry this equation one step further, I have to do this. Multiply and divide both sides of this equation so y to the power alpha, y to the power alpha. <coughs> Forget this rest. k to the power alpha divided by y to the power alpha. Bravo. <laughs> excellent, excellent, great. So I am bringing this gentleman uh, under k and call this v to the power alpha. All agreed? All right. <coughs> and I am keeping this a to the power 1 minus alpha. I have uh, got rid of this. I have y to the power alpha and l. I behave like a uh, <coughs> high school arithmetic teacher here, I realize. But we are going to come to the economics of this, I promise. But let's do the math for uh, uh, correct now. So I have here y divided by l to the power alpha. And this is equal to y over l. So I move this character over this side. I say y, <coughs> y over l to the power 1 minus alpha, v to the power alpha, a to the power 1 minus alpha. I, I got rid of this power and say that y over L is simply V over alpha over 1 minus alpha power. And this 1 minus alpha disappears. But now let's do some fun. Let's introduce our V when under steady state. Now let's be an economist. <clears throat> so over here, instead of V, we are going to use 
s over x plus n plus delta to the power alpha minus 1 minus alpha times a. Now this is equal to per capita income in any country. And under my neoclassical world, per capita income is governed by saving rate, some parameters, level of technology, its growth rate, and the growth rate of population. Now, uh, what I shall do, from here on, like uh, over here, the last time, I'm going to say that depreciation rate is not a very uh, interesting economic variable to talk about in economics or in, in this story. Most probably you have never used depreciation rate in your analysis. Uh, it's just, it's been lingering around because we are uh, using this capital uh, accumulation equation. So, uh, as before, I am going to ignore this. Since I am dealing with per capita, okay, output per, per uh, labor, the rate of growth of population is not that important under the steady state. Because if I impose the steady state, per capita output will be constant. Even if you are 2 billion Chinese or 200 people, Output per worker is not affected by the growth rate of population. So n is also a factor to ignore. In the neoclassical explanation of per capita income differences. Because output and population will be growing at the same rate anyway, under the warranted rate of growth. So uh, under per capita, uh, Po the size of population is not important. It is the ratio that is important. That's what I am trying out after. Now, uh, x and a. Look, it's somewhat hard to uh, swallow. I understand and appreciate. But uh, my daughter has, don't blame me, has the uh, most advanced iPhone in the universe today, and she is far better than I, and perhaps many of you, in making use out of it. It's not that she is extremely clever or anything. She is cute and clever. Uh, but, uh, but this does not play any role in her ability to use the most advanced technology in the universe today. Technology is something that is widely available. It's out there. You can download from the internet. You can send it by post. You can pirate. You can steal. Uh, 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 I mean, at the age of globalization, I am not going to pay any money on something called property rights. Matt Bey bunu siliyoruz, değil mi? So, uh, technology is a public good available to all countries, in essence, in theory. Its adaptation is based on institutions, in a, uh, education level of societies. That's another matter. But as it is, the technology, the black, black box, is out there as a publicly available good. At its extreme, I can simply say that it is the Solovian idea that technology <clears throat> is exogenous. And that's why Solovian growth, or Solov's neoclassical 
model is called exogenous growth models, as opposed to endogenous growth models, which had uh, come into our profession in early 1990s. Until now, we have worked with exogenous treatment of technology where it is considered as publicly available. Oh. <laughs> I am emphasizing this because I am scared that at the back of your mind there is still hojam. However, but uh, uh, technology is an important thing in trying to explain per capita income differences. You have to introduce a behavioral stupidity if some country is not using the most available technology and if you rest your theory of per capita income differences on technology differences. Because it is publicly available out there. You have to be an idiot if you are not making use of it. That's the neoclassical exogenous growth model say. Why are you using it? It's out there. It's publicly available. But if you are uh, creating excuses for some reason or another, that is uh, your problem. In theory, it's out there to be used. That means ignore, ignore. These are not economic problems to solve. These are, if they exist in explaining per capita income differences, if they play a role, it is not because of the market mechanism works or the, uh, the economic relationships work. It is because of anthropological or social or uh, any other non-economic historical uh, explanations. And we are not out there to, to act as, uh, uh, as such. What are we left with? Per capita income in the United States is the saving rate of United States to the power alpha divided by 1 minus alpha. Şöyle yapalım, şu eşit işaretini biraz daha aşağıya alayım. Uh, I'm just rewriting this, do not panic. S United States, alpha over 1 minus alpha. Divided by y over L of any poor country that you can imagine. From sub-Saharan Africa to the the slums of Latin America or uh, to uh, the <coughs> slums of India or uh, East Asia, any place, poor. Same, saving rate of the poor country to alpha over one minus alpha. Or simply, <coughs> since again, technology is same, alpha and one minus alpha are technological parameters. It's out there, public knowledge. I am just keeping them this. So the whole thing depends on saving rate differences. So income of rich to income of poor per capita income, right, uh, is a factor of saving rich, saving poor to alpha over 1 minus alpha. That's the bottom line. It is the amount of capital stock that matters. And capital 
is the end result or capital accumulation rather. Capital accumulation is the end result of saving and investment behavior. If there are today per capita income differences, it's because the size, the amount of capital stock is different. Previously, historically, rich countries saved and invested more than today's poor countries who had saved and invested less, but they keep on trying. So at the end of the day, when we all reach to this long run equilibrium steady state, the poor countries will save and invest little by little, little by little, and reach to the level of today's rich countries. And this is when the whole nations will converge to a single steady state equilibrium. There is no disruptions, no crises. All you have to do is sit back, sit back and relax. Just keep on what you were doing. The market will provide you the sufficient and relevant signals for you to do whatever necessary. It's almost we are all in an automatic pilot. The market's revealing wage rate, profit rate, <coughs> if there are more than uh, one commodity relative prices, seeing the profit rate, the capitalists will save and invest the necessary amount to resolve the Harad Domar pessimist confusion. What about today? As of this moment, you are seeing the end result of differences in saving rates. This is the story. I'm going to continue more on this on Wednesday, but just before we leave, let's do this very simple exercise so that uh, Wednesday's lecture will be uh, uh, a really a big excitement. Uh, <clears throat> when we look at the uh, differences in saving rates across the globe, the highest saving rate typically is uh, 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 known to be from Asia, Chinese, Vietnamese, Malaysians, Koreans, for some historical reason, they save more than Europeans, definitely more than Latin Americans. Uh, Latinos, anyway, I'm not going to make any remarks, uh, but uh, uh, it's party time. Okay? Uh, and Turkey is a Latin American country. Philippines, Argentina, and Turkey. Three Latin American countries, as I said, in the first day of the lecture. But uh, what all of these translate in uh, saving rates, differences, typically it is a factor of four. I mean, you cannot save everything, you have to consume. So there is an upper limit, it is not 30 times. Uh, uh, it's about the highest saving economies save four times as much as the less saving countries. That's a typical data, and we are going to work on this. So this gap, SR to SP, is four. Alpha. What is alpha? In Where does this alpha come from? Cobb-Douglas, right? Y is k to the power alpha. Ta, 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 ta. What is alpha? All right, it's definitely zero and one. Uh, uh, and it, it's the elasticity of substitution of capital for output. But it is also the share of capitalist income. That is rate of return to capital R times K divided by Y. Share of capital income share. 1 minus alpha, labor income share, including technology in my setting. Alpha, share of capital income, for some uh, mythological reason, in uh, empirical relationships, alpha is typically taken one third, 
therefore, 1 minus alpha labor share is taken as 2 thirds. Uh, I'm not going to get into ta 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 ta, -ta of this uh, uh, assumption. Just, just for the sake of the argument, OK, 1 third capital income, 2 thirds labor income. Just for my purpose, I am going to take alpha 1 third. Therefore, 1 minus alpha is 2 thirds. So if this is what data tells me, let's put in the numbers. Saving rates differ by far folds. <clears throat> alpha 1 third divided by 2 thirds. That is 4 to the power half, which is 2. E, ne oldu şimdi? Evet. evet. According to all of this story that I had been telling for almost two hours now, under neoclassical hypothesis, with some plausible data, right? You can always now you can look for huge uh, uh, Google and come up with an economy which is saving 80 percent, and some other country saving one percent. I'm making generalizations, all right? So uh, available uh, uh, average data tells me that with all of the steady state assumptions and all of them, I can explain per capita income differences up to two folds. That is the gap between the richest and the poorest country under plausible assumptions and plausible uh, uh, hypothesis. I can explain as a factor of two. Well, this is not very decent. Buyurun. Tabi, yani uh, income of rich, income of poor, according to data, is income of the rich is twice the income of the poor. Dirt saving differences. Rich people save four times more than poor people do. And, or in fact, they have, that's what the data tells me, historically. What can you do? What do you want to do? You have to increase this number. I mean, you have to make this model to have a more explanatory power. Income differences across the world is about 1 to 50, 1 to 30. Richest country is 30 times rich than uh, the, what uh, David Colander called the bottom 1 billion, where they earn less than $1 a day. About $300 of per capita income. Over, uh, uh, over a year. Don't think as an economist. Uh, uh, economics, as I said, is a simple thing. You, we hire a good Oxford literature person, and uh, uh, he or she can tell what, uh, what to tell. Uh, think of as an, in terms of this relationship, what should you change? I'm not going to allow you to change any assumptions or hypotheses here. We are in the neoclassical world. Uh, the the OK, uh, all right. I'm going to swallow, uh, uh, continue with this idea, but uh, there was one more suggestion here. Savings, Savings is data driven. But uh, <coughs> capital, uh, capital share, that is. What is capital? When I say share of capital, what comes to your mind? So they produce more capital. Okay, but as in essence, uh, capital is what? Buildings, machinery, what else? Human, are your brains capital? Yes, what's inside? I mean, you have been investing uh, so many years in time. Uh, 
rather than uh, having fun outdoors. We are in this lecture. We are investing in our knowledge. Human capital can also be part of capital. Finance capital, physical capital, agricultural capital. See, I mean, we can always rent uh, a, a Oxford trained graduate assistant here and come up with uh, human capital, cap physical capital. So I can change this number. Let's make alpha 2 thirds. In fact, the most recent data that I am using from OECD puts capital shared at least to 65% of OECD countries' income. But that's, uh, uh, I mean, even at the empirical data. Remember, I said this is a mythology, but for the sake of the argument, we keep it. So 1 minus alpha is 1 third. Apply the same logic. 4 to the power 2 over 3 to the power uh, 1 third. These gentlemen cancel out. And now I get 16. Now I can explain per capita income differences up to 16 times differences. Why stop at 2 thirds? Continue. Make it 90%. What happens if I make it alpha equals 1? What happens to the Cobb Douglas model? Uh, Tamam, uh, what kind of a relationship do I get? Y is equal to A times K to the power 1. Have you seen this model? AK model. You see, we are back to AK model if you really pursue this idea. Why do you stop at 2 thirds? 90 percent, 99, one more run, 100. You cannot go 110 percent. I mean, come on. Where did you see the AK model? Uh, in what context? Endogenous growth. It is the simplest, the uh, most straightforward, and due to its simplicity, the most innovative, brilliant endogenous growth model you can imagine. Why, do we need, why did we need that model? Because of the tyranny of these numbers saying that, look, the exogenous neoclassical growth model cannot capture the real life. One step to do is increase capital share. Right? That's how we come to this argument. All right, then tut mayın kendinizi. Go, lads. Just go to 100%. Capital share, including human capital. There is no labor. There is no agriculture. There is capital. It's capital capital, only one factor of production, and now we can both uh, explain an endogenous growth and also to the fact that per capita income differences can be explained to, to your satisfaction. On Wednesday, I'm going to introduce some data in checking this, prepare you another homework for you to work on this. And then we are going to continue with the neoclassical model.